this is Vishnu again. I'm here to introduce our next speaker, Wagner Silveira. Wagner, originally from Brazil, uh, has been working in integration space since 2002. Uh, lately, he has been focusing on Azure cloud integration technologies such as Logic Apps, Service Bus, and Azure Functions. Wagner is an active member in Auckland Connected Systems User Group, MSDN Forums, and one of the organizers of New Zealand community events such as Integration Saturday and Global Integration Bootcamp Auckland. He's currently working as Principal Integration Architect at Theta. Uh, being a Microsoft Azure MVP, he also holds a MCSA in Cloud Platform and MCS, MCTS in BizDoc Server. Today, he's going to talk about unlocking Azure hybrid integration with Vistock Server. Let's welcome Wagner onto the stage. As you said, my name is Wagner, and I'm a principal integration architect at Tita and also an Azure MVP. So today, I'm going to be talking about uh, uh, unlock Azure hybrid integration with Vistock Server. What we're going to have on the agenda for today is why Vistock and Azure, right? So, uh, uh, Todd alluded to some of that, that Bistock is not just, uh, uh, really loves logic apps. It also loves a lot of other uh, Bistock te uh, uh, Azure technology, right? We're going to see what is the hybrid integration option, so what are the adapters that are there that help us to do this, and what scenarios that they can fit in well. Then go through some design considerations, so think about like, what should I be the, uh, uh, planning when I'm doing the, the, the Bistock hybrid integrations? And finally, some takeaways that I hope that is tasty enough. So the first thing is why Bistock and Azure? What Bistock brings to hybrid integration? If you think about it, it has like a whole lot of very mature uh, uh, on-premise adapters. Right, things that are still not available in applications like uh, uh, logic apps for the connectivity, but is there on Bistock for a long time. On the other side of the coin, it also has a good set of Azure, uh, Azure adapters, right, that allow you to do the linking, so it becomes exactly what Bistock does all the time, the perfect middleman. It allows you to do a separation of concerns. So when you're thinking about hybrid integration, is usually a good part of your uh, uh, workflow is sitting just on-prem, and you can do like all this kind of work inside Bistock instead of doing this link shot approach where things go to the cloud and come back when they should be talking to uh, uh, on-prem to on-prem. And it also uh, uh, brings a set of availability that is still not read in some cases on, uh, uh, on the cloud. As you see on Dan's presentation a bit ago, he said that the on-premise data gateway that is, would be a great asset to connect on-prem systems to the, uh, things like logic apps and other connectors. You still don't have the availability uh, story. It's coming, but it's still not there yet, right? Bistock has that out of the box. And what about you are already a user of Bistock, right? What it, what it brings to you on this? The first is leverage of investment, right? You don't have to rip everything out of the, uh, uh, your system and go to the cloud. You can actually make sure that those two uh, uh, platforms play really well together. And give you continuity. Give continuity to your developers, Right, so they understand, uh, uh, it already understands how Bistock works, and then you can go and, and just learn the extra bit that is the connectivity with the cloud. It gives you connectivity to your the, uh, support team, to people that are there. So, hopefully I convince you guys that Bistock as a hybrid integration middleman makes sense. Right? If that's the case, let's do a little journey to the cloud and back, finding out what the, the Bistock brings to the table. So when you're talking about connecting to Azure, doing like the Jack and the Beanstalk kind of a, a, a situation, how can we do that? We can use Service Bus, right? So we have a way to connect to Service Bus. 
we have a way to connect to the Azure WCF relay and uh, leverage from that WCF relay that uh, uh, Dan was just showing a bit ago. We can connect to app services and uh, uh, like API apps, Azure Functions, and to API management in various ways, right? In most of the, those cases leveraging from the web HTTP uh, uh, protocol. And you can connect, of course, with the logic apps. So let's start talking about service bus. What's a, the way that we talk, talk to you or, or help you to use service bus is through the SB messaging adapter, right? That adapter gives to you inbound and outbound connectivity. That means that you can go to, to a, a service bus topic or subscription or, or queue in the cloud, or you can uh, uh, go to the service bus in the cloud and bring the information back. As I said, it allows you to talk to both queues and topics. It allows you to do that securely, right? It still supports ACS, but also supports SAS. That means that when you connect into Azure or, or connect into Service Bus, you can guarantee the minimum uh, uh, required security there. And it gives you one thing that BizTalks use really well for the, the uh, routing and content based. It allows you to propagate properties that is being put on your uh, uh, service bus message down to, uh, uh, to be stock, or to create a, a property back that can be used in uh, topic subscriptions. We're going to see a little bit about how that happened on be stock, right? If the demo gods are, uh, are with us, it's going to work fine. But right now, let's take a little bit about what scenarios service bus message would, uh, would unlock on a hybrid scenario. So all sorts of async workflows, right? Mess things where you actually don't need that real-time communication. You can go and send the message to Ceph's bus, guarantee that the message is there, and from there you can uh, uh, leave the other system, the system on the other side, pick it up, or the other way around. Bring the message to Service bus and let Bistock pick it up when it needs to. That allows you to overcome a, a, a bit of uh, unreliability on your connections, right? How many people here have systems where the connection is not that great and you don't really can uh, 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 trust the uh, real-time communication? I have a cup of that before. Yes, I can see a show of hands. It allows you also to guarantee that you consume the message at your pace, not at the pace of anywhere else is, uh, anyone else is giving it to you, right? So you can control the throttling. And that's coming from uh, uh, some examples that I had in the past where the message uh, was flooding a system and you didn't have any control of that. That's quite useful. And also, if you think about uh, the uh, top screen subscriptions that comes with Service Bus, you allow you to do multicasting. So you can send a message from the stock to Service Bus. The message is going to be uh, uh, going through a topic, and anyone that is interested on that message can uh, uh, pick up. Next on the list is our friend WCF Relay that Tom was, uh, uh, Dan was showing to you, right? is using the WCF basic HTTP relay adapter. S compared to service bus, this one now allow you to unlock inbound and outbound two-way communication. It is, that means that you can either expose or consume WCF services, right? And it's based on dynamic, uh, uh, dynamic relays, which means that uh, in this case, once you have the WCF relay set up, or, or uh, uh, the relay namespace set up, you don't have to go to the portal anymore to do anything. When you create a relay on this talk, it creates that automatically for you, as long as you have permission to do it. And works up something like this, right? Bistock connects to the relay, 
when someone needs to talk to BizTalk, is actually going to be talking to the relay, and the, uh, uh, the relay is going to be the next middleman in the story. It is primed for XML, right? So that, uh, because it's based on WCF, it's expecting uh, XML messages. When I was doing testing on the, the, the uh, uh, relay, I find out by mistake that actually, if you put anything that is not XML there and don't say to the relay what you're sending, by default, it's going to uh, wrap all of that in a binary element, right? So I could see some kind of uh, 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 hacks around that to allow you to bring JSON inside the, the, your the, uh, Bish talk, as long as you have a little component that decrypt that, that uh, uh, convert that from basic 64 to, to whatever it's the, the message. So that means that in theory, although it is primed for XML, you can pass something else and it's going to be wrapping that on a binary XML element. And again, when you're configuring the, the uh, uh, relay, you do the same thing that we're doing for any one of the other service bus uh, uh, systems, right? You're going to be using ACS or SAS, so the, uh, either the access control services or the, the shared access signature, and you can restrict as much as possible your permissions. That's when you're connecting the system, the, the be stock to the relay. On the other side, we also have the extra endpoint security, right? So you can do either an anonymous authentication when you pass into the relay, or you can actually create relay access tokens. That guarantees that only people that need to talk to that relay, although exposed publicly, can talk to that. Uh, REST support. What is my scenarios? Someone ate my scenarios. <laughs> mm -hmm. But that's fine. We can, we can encapsulate all of them together because the REST support is also going to give me uh, uh, something similar to this. Right? So when you're talking about the REST support, we're talking about the WCF HTTP relay. It's, in this case, exposing REST services because I'm talking about the, the, the inbound only. It allows you to do one or two ways. That means that you can send a message to be stuck and forget about it, or you can uh, uh, get something from that. So if you think about it, it's similar in a way to the WCF relay, right? With one advantage, it support multiple formats by default. And with one disadvantage, you have to go and actually the, the, uh, do some changes either on your network or using a hybrid co uh, connection on top of that to let it go. One thing that is uh, interesting on the WCF Web HTTP, when you're thinking about workflows and, and you're thinking about how we're going to, to receive the message and, and deal with that, is the ability that the uh, uh, WCF Web HTTP has to get your REST path that has a whole lot of information on, on that and convert them to promoted properties for you to actually drive your, your workflow. And the web HTTP uh, uh, adapter also allow you to define outbound headers to guarantee that whatever the system is expecting from you, the, the, the other endpoint is expecting for, from you is passed back when, when you need to. Similar to that, you have the same kind of technology going outbound, right? So in this case, you're going to be consuming REST services. And if you think about it in, uh, in that, the services that we're talking here, since we're talking unlocking Azure, is things like Azure Functions, is your API apps that you created, or API management, right? You can do it one way or two ways, just like the other ones. And in this case, because usually those, uh, uh, those applications on the other side are not going to be using uh, any other port other than 18443, right? You don't require any kind of network changes unless your uh, uh, security guy is really, really, really paranoid and then you have other problems before that anyway. 
dissimilar to uh, uh, the mapping from a path to promoted properties, you can actually create, uh, create a dynamic path on uh, uh, the WCF Web HTTP. What that means, instead of you having to write or, or derive your, your path to go to a, a specific place in code all the time, you can actually create tokens and apply promoted properties to that, right? With this, you can actually uh, guarantee that if I have something like uh, customer ID action, that my ID for that specific customer is part of the path and it goes through. And it also allows you to define the outbound headers like the other one, but here is even more important than on, on the receive, right? Because most of those systems, for example, API management, is expecting you to pass some kind of token in order to connect to it. And that ability to define the tokens as part of your uh, adapter when you're passing it through makes it quite useful. Now I have scenarios. Right, so what scenarios can we see here for that? If you think about the inbound real-time communication, as we said, right, so compared to, to the service bus, now I can actually do like receive requests and, and coming back and forth all the time. You can expose your legacy of bespoke applications, but you're doing that minimizing the surface area. Right, so before if you wanted to, even if your systems would understand some of those, uh, uh, some of those technologies or, or would be able to expose that, what's going to happen was you'd have to open a whole lot of pokers, uh, uh, holes in your firewall, right? So the old story about the, the Swiss sheets firewall. In this case, what you're going to have is a Swiss cheese with one hole and that hole goes just to be stock. Which that means that it simplifies integration because then you have a protocol that you know and that the, the, uh, the new kids on the block of the, the new applications understand and you translate all of that to stuff that is legacy, that is boring but needs to be done and it needs to for the system to, uh, or the integration to work. If you think about the outbound side, you can leverage public APIs. You can have uh, uh, things that you expose, but you still need to consume internally, right? In one thing, especially if you're thinking about functions, and that's uh, 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 something that I think Michael Stefferson did uh, 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 some time ago and wrote a, uh, a post about, you can shift com uh, uh, compute to the cloud. How many people has the typical story where once a month, I have a spike, right? And then I have what I have to do, make sure that my whole B-stock uh, 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 infrastructure is catering for that spike of one month. What about that spike is actually made for the, the uh, uh, increase on, on compute? And what about you could extract that compute from B-stock to somewhere else like Azure Functions? that could scale any way that, uh, that you want. So you could make sure that your uh, B-stock investment is just the, enough to run your day-to-day -day and have all those uh, uh, fluctuations or, or extra stuff happening outside. So taking advantage of both, uh, uh, both words. Finally, our very good friend, Logic Apps, right? So the, the, the typical last but not least. We have a Logic Apps adapter that would uh, uh, allow you to do inbound and outbound workflows one or two ways, so that is the most versatile of all the, the, the adapters. It extends the workflow, right? So the idea is extend workflows, either inbound workflows or, or outbound workflows, which means that now I can decide part of my process is going to be happening on-prem, uh, on are going to be running one of those things. And then when I need to go to there, either by the, uh, uh, for a series of reasons, because I cannot talk to Salesforce easily enough, or because I have to, to the, uh, uh, send a tweet, or because I actually need to scale that part of the workflow, it can be doing that using the 
uh, uh, logic apps. Or I can get the logic apps and bring stuff uh, uh, to pre-validate a whole lot of things and bring it inside for me to continue to work, right? Usually okay, there's no network changes on the outbound because again, logic apps is uh, exposing an HTTP endpoint on port 443. And if you have the, the security guy, the crazy security guy, we already know the story, right? On the way in is a similar story to the, the logic, sorry, to the REST adapter, right? You need to do some network changes. But here you have the option to use the uh, on-premise data gateway, and then you have to think about your availability. If you think about scenarios, if you're going to be talking to logic apps, as I said, SAS integration is the classic, was like a, 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 the first thing that we'd all thought about using logic apps with which talk together. But also you can have the on-demand scale, right? Going back to the, the, the same uh, example that we have, where my one, once a month fluctuation or, or a spike, now it's not just some compute, it's actually a whole lot of workflows that I have to, to do. I have to send messages to, to like 3,000, 5,000 customers. You can leverage from logic apps to, to do that heavy lifting for you, right? And don't have to, and don't have to, to make sure the, the, your be stock infrastructure is so inflated. When you're talking about logic apps to be stock, the first one is secure internal systems, right? Now, if, you, uh, uh, if you're using logic apps as your proxy to come inside, you don't have to expose a whole lot of other things. Again, similar to, to the, the, the web HTTP. And you can do like pre-validation of messages, messaging, making sure that the message when it comes to you is ready to use and discard messages even before it needs to get to be stock. And finally, and that's a, a, a very important a, a point, leverage of the plethora of uh, on-prem connectors, right? A whole lot of things that we're not able to do just using the, the, the on-prem data gateway, but if you pass it through BStock, you, you have access to that. Also expose legacy, which means that you probably would be able to expose your legacy and bespoke systems to the, the, uh, uh, to the whole workflow. Hands on? Should we? Did you guys uh, 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 sacrifice some USB connectors or uh, uh, USB adapters for me? So what I'll try to do? I'm going to, to create one relay, one service bus uh, 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 queue, and one logic apps, right? And when when I create a relay, system one is going to be sending a message to my line of business one, right? When I connect to the service bus, system two is going to be sending messages and are going to be routing that depending on uh, 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 what is the location. If it's a SaaS application, it goes to, through logic apps to somewhere else. If it's an on-prem uh, uh, application, it comes to my, uh, uh, to my line of business. And because it still didn't see, uh, uh, didn't see a file drop or a tweet demo, right? My demo is going to be line of business one, line of business two, of course, are two file drops. And the logic apps goes to tweet. I thought that you guys were going to be really excited by finally having some tweets coming out of logic apps again. So, as I was saying, what I have here are two uh, uh, receive locations, right? Let's start with the WCF relay that is the simplest one in this case. And when you're creating a WCF relay, basically what you need to give is your namespace, right, that you're going to, to get that from your service bus relay, uh, uh, WCF relay object in, in Azure, and you decide what is the location, 
right? Once you do that, you configure, that is going to be created uh, directly in, in Azure. So just to show you, that's the story. Right now, here on Service Bus 360, I have my relay namespace with Integrate 2017, right? You can see that? With one listener, right? And that's because BizTalk is connected to that. Okay, if I go and disable it should disappear from here. Fingers crossed. There we go. So that's what I was talking about, the, the story that uh, is a dynamic relay. You just need to deal with that as long as you have the, the right keys and the, the, the uh, right namespace. You deal with all of that on BizTalk, right? The adapter is talking to, to the uh, uh, WCF relay and creating those things. But we need that to do the actual demo, right? So let me turn it on again. And what I'm gonna do is use Postman to call that, right? So we have the relay with a body. And that doesn't go to Twitter yet. So that actually, this is a demo that should do a file drop. So as I said, the, the, uh, the client that is consuming the relay actually going to a line of business one, right? And that would be the folder called LOB inside of a, a BizTalk. It went somewhere. And on my LOB here at 2.12, so yes, this is a demo that should go to a file drop. Exciting. Right, yes, thank you. I did the very first file drop of the uh, demo on Integration 2017. And I'll follow that by doing the second one. So, back here on, on, on Beach talk. Let's take a look at what you can do with the, uh, the service bus messaging. Again, the configuration is extremely easy, right? In this case, I need the fully qualified name of my queue. And I need to pass the authentication parameters. The same thing that I needed to do uh, uh, on the WCF relay, by the way, right? So that I didn't show that. But the thing that is quite Cool here is if I define a promoted proper, a properties schema, the properties that are inside that message would come through and attach to that schema as long as they match, right? And all of a sudden you have a way to actually do routing. You would be asking how did I do the routing on the other one? I use the, the, the oldest trick in the book that is attached to receive location, right? So send port attached to, to, to receive port. On that one, I'm going to be doing proper uh, uh, routing. So just to show what happens here, on my send ports, okay, I'm still on time. Send to line of business, sorry, not send to line of business, Send to SAP because I really have delusions of grandeur, right? My, my file drop is actually the, uh, thinking that it's SAP. My filters are going to say if I have a beach talk demo, blah, 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 which is my uh, uh, property set to SAP, drop on, on, on SAP 0 0.001, which is a file drop. And how am I going to be doing that? I have something ready here.
Since Saravana yesterday showed us that we have a, a, a way to send the messages through Service Plus 360, I'm just going to leverage from that. All right, I have a set of activities here. In my, my demo one that goes to SAP, I'm going to send. And it should be going, going, gone. Fingers crossed. Come on, wake up. There you go. On my SAP folder, I should have a message as 215. And guess what? We also didn't have any hello world, right? So another one, another first. Finally, I'm going to show you, I'm using the same send, uh, uh, service bus, but now attached to uh, uh, the Logic Apps adapter. And the Logic Apps adapter, I don't think needs any uh, uh, introduction, but just in case, right? Basically, the only thing you need to do is either add your uh, uh, callback URL there, or if you really don't uh, 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 want to go through clicks, you can do that through the, uh, uh, this Logic Apps detail page. I might be wrong, but I think it's the only uh, uh, caveat on that page is that you need a work, uh, work with school account for that work. Because yesterday I was testing like with my uh, uh, Microsoft account, it didn't work. When I put the, the, the work with school account, it worked fine. And then you can go select your subscription, select your resource group, select your logic app, boom, it's done. Okay? So for the next part, you guys have to take a look at your uh, 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 Twitter and see if a Twitter is going to come if I run that one here. Drum roll. All of that is going through Bishtalk, and while you guys say if it worked or not, and let me know what we have uh, uh, written there, I can show you that, for example, the last one went through Logic Apps, right? The previous one went through the SP message and the file adapter. So all of that came all the way from the cloud down to Bistock, and in theory, I could have like a very complex uh, uh, workflow there. And instead of that, I just drop files in the file, uh, uh, in the, the, the file folder. Did anyone got any tweets on Integrate 2070? From me? No? Come on. Oh, it went to, to the uh, uh, Logic Apps. Works on, on no, uh, on my one? No. Okay, you need to find something like this. Ah, uh, come on. Ah. The demo gods didn't accept my, my uh, uh, didn't accept my thing. Well, I'll, I'll not go in at, uh, on that because I think I have one minute and I still have like a couple of things to say to you guys. Trust me, it worked on my machine. Uh, I know. Uh, jet lag. I didn't have a jet lag one yet, yes. Okay, well, just to finish that, and I know that uh, uh, Martin is waiting for me to, to finish so he can come and talk to you about Power Apps. With great choices comes great responsibility, right? Spider-Man already said that. <laughs> what I mean for that is that uh, uh, if you think you need to take some of the uh, uh, decisions, when you're designing your systems, remember that not everything is a nail. What I mean by that, you have, as I showed you, a whole lot of different ways to connect to, to the uh, Bistalk to, to the cloud and back, right? So try to choose which one is the most appropriate for that. So know your tools, understand the sweet spots of each one of them. 
Come on. And most important, like understand when to avoid, right? And mix match experiment, so test those things so you know you know them well enough so you can use it, right? And and, and design properly. The other thing that is quite important, and I think a whole lot of people already touched that, but it's never uh, uh, enough to, to say, price is a new dimension on your design, right? Before you have like your B-stock there, you already paid like thousands for the license anyway, so stuck, stick everything on B-stock. Now, if you try to do the same thing with the cloud, you're going to have like bill of the bill of the bill. So making sure that you do like the, the, the real fine balance between there are things that should be staying on B-Stock, there are things that should go in, uh, uh, to the cloud, and those two should be living well together. Right, so understand the benefits of each one of them. And remember the, uh, uh, the development versus the operation costs, because sometimes you're going to be doing the chicken, the chicken way, doing the, the, the shortcut. But in this case, the, the chicken way might cost you. And those shortcuts will cost you badly. Right? So to finish some takeaways, first thing is there are many ways to integrate, like I said. There's a whole lot of ways. Know your tools, making sure that you understand them so you can use it uh, uh, then properly. Mix, match, experiment. Try the things, make sure that you understand them. Make sure that you know when they don't work as you expected. When it's going to be, like, give you a, a really big bill. So you can find the balance between the right development, the right maintenance, and the right uh, uh, operational costs, right? And just as a final parting thought, I don't think that it's just like B-Stock plus Azure better together. I think it's a little bit more than that. B-Stock loves Azure, right? If you want to uh, uh, contact me, here is the, uh, uh, my information. So, I always on, on Twitter and reach me on, on email. And thank you. <laughs>